Hello, um, I, my name is Deborah Rosinski. I'm executive director of Bainbridge Arts and Crafts, and I'm here today with Jeffrey Bowton, who we're excited to be um, showing in our November exhibition called Art and Service, Art by and About Veterans. Um, Jeffrey is a veteran of um, time in Afghanistan primarily, is that right? Yeah, I, I served uh, for six years and deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. So two different types of exposures to the mm -hmm. Middle East. And uh, I learned about you, Jeffrey, when um, you were giving a, a Zoom talk along with um, another glass artist to the Smithsonian, Renwick. Yeah, Josh, yeah. Yeah, Josh Simpson. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, wow, how have I never heard of this person before? <laughs> Who is he? And I looked you up and, and your work is so powerful and so immersed in your experience in the military and after. And um, we're just thrilled that you agreed to show with us. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate being here. Uh, yeah, it's a great opportunity to sit here and kind of share some of my story. Um, so I'm happy that I was invited. So thanks so much. So um, you've done multiple things in your life and work and, and uh, wherever you are comfortable starting telling your story, uh, feel free to dive in. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, for me, um, I was, I, I came to the army late, uh, serving late. And um, I, was, I was a young person working in the building trades in, in the Portland, Oregon area as a sheet metal worker. So I spent uh, time going through their program, learning the apprenticeship, um, becoming the journeyman and, and moving on with my career. Spent 15 years doing that. And during 2008 and the recession is when work really dried up all over the place. And I was really interested in serving, um, you know, right around the 9-11 time. But for me, it just wasn't necessarily practical with the family and the work that I was doing. So the timing worked out in 08 and that's when I decided to serve. So I was 32 um, going in, so I had nicknames like Pops and things like that. But it was it was interesting to be there at that kind of um, intellectual space. I could process things differently. I could understand differently. So I felt I had a unique experience. Um, I spent six years in service uh, through 2009 and 10. I deployed to Iraq and then I went to Afghanistan in 11 and 12, um, kind of piggyback between the end of the year to the front of the year. Um, yeah, and I served in the infantry, so I was on the line uh, in the platoons um, during Iraq, doing patrols. Um, we we're during uh, election time, so there's a lot of different types of political things happening. Uh, my Afghanistan experience was a little different. Um, a lot of energy, a lot of action happening where we were at, so there was just, um, two different experiences, but it certainly had me exposed to working with different types of people. And so that I feel pretty honored to have had. Um, my second time um, serving, I, I became an uncommissioned officer and the people in charge of me were interested in one, why I was so old. And then, you know, I had other things to offer them. So I started doing like construction work on the side, you know, amongst all my duties for the, the leadership. And that kind of manifest into a place where in garrison, I was doing things on the post, helping soldiers in their barracks, things like that. But when we transitioned, uh, doing like iconography awards and things like that. But when we transitioned to country, um, a lot of things were fabricated with wood and to kind of improve the living environment and like our our informational spaces that we kept all the, you know, all of our computers, things like that. We had to have a fortified position. So we built and fabricated a lot of things um, on the side from when my regular duties were over for the day. That's when I detach and um, start working in what we called the whiskey wood shop and basically just producing really anything we could think of that was necessary, like places to put our gear when we set things down um, after the shift for the day or just simply like a coffee pot holder or something that makes sense that we could use in our space for living. It was kind of like we're living while fighting in Afghanistan. So I started working with iconography and other things in my free time. 
and making things to influence others, uh, kind of lighten the moods. And it was a lot of fun. Um, and that, that's where I think my art first kind of started for me. I came back after service and was dealing with some injuries, um, dealing with some things that I wasn't necessarily sure or aware of. And a lot of things were happening at once. So I kind of fell back to what I knew and went back to construction. This is after getting out in six years of service and tried to sort my life out after then. Um, I had you know, physical trouble, uh, some mental trouble, of course, and processing everything. So after a couple of years of uh, serving back in the building trades, um, I took time to for myself finally. I went and uh, checked in more to the VA, got some surgeries taken care of, um, started to work more progressively on my future rather than just kind of every day is a, another busy day. Uh, just, it was hard to unplug. So that's kind of what led me into art was falling back on my experiences from Afghanistan and then being in, you know, kind of instigated to do more with that because of the transitional space I was in. I couldn't work and my old identity was, was changing. So I felt that joining up and doing something with the Montgomery GI Bill and going to school would be most beneficial uh, and using the skill sets that I had. And so I didn't understand what that was gonna be like for me, but it certainly turned into art therapy. Um, you know, I was asked all of these questions of what's important to me. And then, you know, how do you depict that visually? And so that really started the, the prompts for me to work on what was I keeping inside of myself? What did I really need to talk about? And how could I share this with others? And that's the last thing you really want to confront yourself with and then, then turn around and share with others. So I think for me, um, because of the environment I was in, it was, it was encouraging more, my, encouraging me more to do those things not only for myself, but I also saw that there could be benefit for others. Um, and that's kind of been like, I've never really looked back from then. And that was in 2015 when I, I started school and I've just been putting all my eggs in that basket and really uh, about six, uh, seven, eight years now, I've been just kind of productively working through art. So, and here and we are. <laughs> Oregon College of Arts and Crafts. So. Yeah, I went to my undergraduate at Oregon College of Art and Crafts. Um, I spent four years there. I did a fellowship with the Wingate Foundation. They're now called Wingate Lamar, I believe. And so I had fellowship opportunities after school. Um, that's where the DC thing came up. There was an opportunity through them partnering for some anniversaries. So I really felt that it was who of me being challenged as the senior to really put effort as much as I possibly could into that application because I just saw all the benefits. And thankfully I was accepted in and I had really springboarded me into the arts because of the, the Center for Craft and what they've kind of provide for your, your future vision, I would say. So um, yeah, I'm really appreciative of those experiences for sure. Yeah, they, they do a lot to support artists in school and transitioning to building careers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, now you're, you're sitting in your studio. I, I see um, bullseye glass uh, behind you and various yeah. tools and things. And um, maybe can you tell us a little bit about how... Um, how are you were introduced to the process that you're using in your work now and how that evolved for you? Yeah, so I was um, earlier discussing like my union career. So I was always uh, thinking metal for since I was 19 years old. I was just, it had always been on my mind. And so when I started, I first was into metal smithing. And after my first year of kind of going through the foundational classes of drawing and painting and some, some other types of things we had, there was a chance to do a summer, uh, a studies program and it was actually in Leibster, Scotland at a place called uh, Northlands Creative Class. Mm -hmm. And so my teacher knowing me uh, for the year had just understood that yeah, I think this guy kind of just needs to get away from things and, 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 and take it in in a different atmosphere. Uh, so she did me a, a blessing in disguise by kind of encouraging me to go and that's where I first uh, experienced class was in at a really um, Phenomenal play. I mean, it's like a romanticizing way to learn about something in a in a place that's just otherly otherworldly, um, up in the highlands of of Scotland. So it was a great experience, and I just fell in love with the idea of what glass was because of the characteristics characteristics of glass. There's similarities when it comes to coal working, 
as it is to metalworking, finishing, things like that. So some of the ambidextrary skill sets that you would use transition really easy into glass. Um, but then a, a glass has got a large diversity of how you then use it. So that's what I've learned once I started working with glass. Um, but I think it was ultimately just the allure of the medium, the, the, the transparencies, the opaque, just the colors. It was very enlightening from kind of like the dark moods that I was, I was in. So it felt great to work with glass. Um, I love it. Yeah. So you've taken an already pretty difficult process and you've made it kind of in a way more elaborate and more difficult, but you've figured out how to do it. And I'm, I'm curious about the specific tools that you've made for yourself to, um, because you're forming molds that you open up and you pack in and you carefully place the color right. that you're using. Can you right. talk about the kind of customizing of process you've developed to to get the yeah? There's there's different there's differences, aren't there? I mean, it's just really right. interesting because I, I feel that if you were simply just focusing on casting alone, there's that's what I originally learned was mold making and casting the lost wax process mm -hmm. in in Northlands in, in Scotland. Um, but sure, there's a lot to be informed there. But what I didn't realize is there's you know since that class. I had been in, in, in and out of studios, either it'd be at Bullseye or um, artists taught classes elsewhere throughout the States, or I've traveled out of the country a few times, but I've absorbed a lot of information. Um, one of my experiences was learning Pat de Vere at Penland um, School of Craft there on the East Coast. I'm sure some people are pretty familiar with Penland. Others might not be, but it's a art camp for adults. And I was there for two and a half weeks and I learned uh, techniques from Alicia Lame. She's been doing it for 20 plus years and really well known in the industry. Um, and I think that that's really where I started to put together the rules of glass don't necessarily mean that they have to be rules for me. Um, so I, I started to take bits and pieces of what I've learned all encompassing and started to figure out what I learned and what I felt comfortable with, how could I kind of use all these bits in my work? And so I, I think when I was going through the thesis work and trying to understand, you know, the overarching idea of what does an installation or what does multiple things look like, um, I, I was forced to kind of use techniques that I didn't know was going to happen. So mold making and that kind of thing. But I'm taking like garments that we wear, like a boot or a glove, or finding ways to model that to be able to silicone mold it, make a master mold of the silicone uh, of the original object, remove that, and then it's a vessel to pour the wax into. And then I start my lost wax casting process to where you, know, you can manipulate and work on the wax. Um, then you pour your refractory mold, you know, do the wax removal process. And then you have what essentially would be a, a, a vessel, you know, like a, a positive space vessel that you fill with negatively and then it, kind of swaps, right? But in essence, when you just kind of stack bits of, of glass in the reservoirs and you melt it all down, that's casting. Well, I'd have this open vessel that I would, you know, path of air in the way I was taught was, you know, taking small shards and spoon loads and kind of delivering them into the mold cavities, sifting them around where you want them and packing them and pushing them. And what really lit me up about that whole idea was um, in my welding career, I spent a lot of time doing custom welding underneath the hood, kind of hyper-focused, looking through the lens in the small space, staring at the, the bead and the welds all day long. And so there's a real kind of connection to the worker in that, that space. And I felt very familiar again with you know body positioning, how you have to move and look through things rather than just standing and staring straight down or using your ambidextrous hands and you know, either side. It was very familiar to the Pat David work um, in terms of welding and those skill sets. So I picked up naturally at it after I fumbled and failed a bunch of times. But um, <clears throat> I, I learned that there's opportunity to make different tools and do different things and challenge myself as I got more advanced into the practice of Pat David. But um, that's when I started, you know, referencing metal skill sets to go, how can I modify this tool to really access these spaces I can't to produce the work? And that's where, you know, I really set myself into the next level of what I was capable of, because without that connection to the tool, 
I don't know how I would get into some of these really kind of bendable, they're, they're undercut spaces of objects, basically. They're not perpendicular access. Um, and yeah, so I've got, I can show you, well, there's one right here. Um, this is one that I might've taken a picture with. But it, I'm using for the powder distribution, I have a funnel tip on the end that um, basically is bought in the craft stores that you can put cake into, or the cake frosting and um, squeeze through uh, the frosting. But I actually have found ways to like take these different ends, um, these tips here and work on, you know, there's all shape, different shapes and sizes. This one's like a, uh, like a really weird shape. This one's more <laughs> of a conical shape. Um, and there's some longer shapes. So it kind of depends on the work that I'm doing, you know, what and how I need to access that space. So perhaps if you see the difference of this funnel and this funnel, this might come in handy trying to get this, this space in the mold reachable where I can't, I, I don't know, but I'm always modifying tools because the work is usually encouraging me to do that because I just can't visually or physically do it. Um, the wire here is what's allowing the, the tool to be a bendable, you know, tool. You can do however you want with it, kind of bend it all around. But it fits, you can bend it to where it fits in your hand and you can hold these things in all different types of, of ways. Um, I've gotten to the point where when my work is scaled up, um, I've got into larger type tools where I make a metal platform and weld the wire together and I've glued on a cork material um, for the packing and the pounding of the glass. Um, and it's kind of the similarities of what works against pressing against that material with, you know, the stickiness of the glass. I've got rubber ends made. I'll use cork tips, um, different types of handles because they'll fit in my hand differently for the uses. So I've got an analog of about 50 different tools that I've made and I'm still trying to make a bunch more <laughs> because usually one might be used and never used again um, until a year later on a really weird mold or something. But if you can think of the boot, for example, and you're looking down the, the top of where your leg would go through a boot, how do you access underneath those areas? How do you get into the swooping toe part um, while you're using the refractory mold? It's it's very challenging. So I think that that's fun for me because I'm using old skills to help me problem solve. Um, and so I'm always the hamster on the wheel solving problems here. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. Lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the joy of being an artist is, is that part of the process and <laughs> the joy yeah. and the pain occasionally. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, here's another little thing really quick, but these are the corks that I was, I can actually <laughs> file and, and, and manipulate the cork ends. This one's kind of like a mushroom tip. Um, and that gets in certain parts of, you know, the negative space and when you're packing. So it's, it's really fun to try to, it's like puzzle building where you're looking what piece fits where, but at the same time, it's dexterity because I'm packing and pushing with this tool into the mold to compress the glass. I have a few videos up online on YouTube and some of that that shows a little more oh. of the activities, but yeah. And and do you use some kind of a binder to make the glass a little bit sticky so it holds to where you're putting it? And, and... I do. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the binders that are used um, between artists that are working with Pathé Bear. Um, I just use gum Arabic. I actually enjoy the gum Arabic for its unique qualities, because I think if you can look in some of my work, I can use a, a larger amount of gum Arabic and then it's gonna burn out against the glass and kind of smoke or discolor it. So the more or less that I use, it also helps in color enhancement, I've learned. So I think that the stickiness of this gum Arabic allows for upside down compression, you know, and it, it just, the glass sticks very uh, firmly together with it. Um, I've tried a few others, but I just feel that that's been the best for me. Yeah, mm -hmm. the gum Arabic. So you can mix it thin or you can mix it thick, but I think it's a matter of the user, what type of work they're doing. Um, and any kind of burnout residual, less is always better. <laughs> but mm -hmm. in my case, I'm, I'm trying to enhance and do unique things. And I felt that that was really a, a kind of a, 
a happy accident at one point. And then I started to go, oh, I'll, I'll be able to utilize this more and started trying it and then effectively using it to like in my recent work, you might've seen it on the, the am, ammo box or the ammo can. There's a difference of transition. It's like the transitional, it's like a powder technique, but it's in the hard glass. Mm -hmm. So it's really unique how it does it. But I, I put more of the gum Arabic on the sides so it burn over to the farther flat sections of the rectangle. And it kind of like highlights like a, kind of like a, um, in photography, how you do this, the darker outer rims. And it's kind of like that almost, but it emphasizes and directs the eye differently. And yeah. so it's a fun way to play with the gum Arabic, I, I've learned. But. Vignetting, kind of drawing the viewer's eye to where you want it to go. Yeah, yeah. For certain things, because my work, it's it's been essentially about like um, history or relics or things from the past. It not that hasn't necessarily tried to resemble something of brand you know newness or likeness of now um mm -hmm. yeah so i think that that does work in the aesthetic um perhaps in some other works i would not do that of course and mm -hmm. so it's it's learning techniques i guess just fumbling on things like that so um when we were talking when you came and brought your work to the gallery you had mentioned um a mentor teacher who had encouraged you in in school to break things and to sort of purposely <laughs> do things that were maybe uncomfortable to kind of work through some of your ideas. And it was really interesting to me how you described what that process meant to you. If yeah, it was a fun moment for me in the end uh, <laughs> because of the revelation that happened for me. But I was really challenged um, with my advisor for the the period of time we we're really looking about answering a question I had and I was you know I, I'm explaining to him and he was a civilian hasn't experienced military or not much in the family histories either so we were learning and exchanging things um, but what um, he was interested in was was challenging the thing that I was stuck on and I was talking about healing you know damage and repair what would healing look like if an artist made something that said healing, you know, um, that's a hard one, I thought. I mean, you can't necessarily do that right away for me. It was tough in the moment. So he's like, well, we're going to take things and break them and just fix them. Let's try that. And because it says damage and repair. And so we went through a few ideas of material use and what could be, you know, important and, and impactful. Um, and he kept asking about glass because you love glass. You're working with glass. We'll break glass and fix it. And I told him, I said, no one in the glass world will intentionally make glass and then want to break it when they're done. <laughs> I thought that's ludicrous. But he said, well, just try it. So I started playing with some different theories, um, breaking some glass that wasn't mine, like a vase and putting it back together, gluing it up. And But I think what for me was once I started to give into the idea of fusing some, like I just used plates, some utilitarian objects, but I was taking hammers. I was taking like um, steel objects, just, you know, dropping them on it or hitting it, or I was recording them and finding ways to just enjoy the damaging part because it felt good to liberate myself of I'm mad, you know, all this stuff in my life just sucks. So I got to break it. And I thought I'm breaking the rules finally, ultimately, <laughs> Uh, but then I was challenged to put it all back together. And so I started thinking of other ways, like, um, you know, what would it look like? Well, a stitch, could I stitch the glass back together, use a copper wire? Can I use colored um, glass to kind of bond the cracks and emphasize the cracks? So what would stand out that said healing? And the more I just kept working with that, the growth continued to happen. Uh, but I came to a point that I was challenged that um, the breaking and what I was doing needed to be more impactful. So I felt I've struggled um, with soldiers um, taking their lives in military service. And I've had, unfortunately, one of my own personal friends and soldiers do that uh, before we left on a deployment. So part of myself was 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 addressing those issues. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, this would be a great time to, to shoot glass with a handgun and, you know, really make a, a, a leap beyond just what I was doing. So I did that, I, I took some glass blanks and they're clear and um, packaged them all up so I could work with them later. Um, took them to a range and shot them and, and came back. And during the process, I, I started to realize, you know, taking them from the damaged state, 
putting them back onto a new kiln shelf. It was really like a puzzle, but one at a time. And the more I started to build and fabricate the new glass, um, I started to really think more about the ripple effects that, that suicide can have on the families, the friends, the coworkers, just everyone in your community. And it's a, it's, it's not pretty, it's, it's not fun, um, but it's a, it needs to be talked about. It's got to be addressed somehow because it's an epidemic. So I felt this is an interesting way to do it. Um, I was successful in doing some freeze fusing with doing powders between the shards. And I made different types of just kind of square paneling, which led me to make a mask and do some um, like photography with the covering parts of my face and kind of showing, and I was in uniform, but really kind of impacting the viewer to say, well, what's happening here? There's this mask type broken shot glass thing in front of a soldier. What are we, what are we looking at? So for me, it's just, you know, what is the viewer taking from my experiences knowing it's been military and then understanding the real meaning behind it. And I felt that I grew a lot. You know, I started to look at that piece in the end and that hole in the middle was that individual. So it says a lot about suicide, just the object because of that missing hole, you know, the glass is damaged and that thing's gone. Well, that's the individual that's missing now from the community of what once was whole. So it's a, uh, it's a tough narrative that we all in military are, are struggling with all branches. And, and it's also affecting our, our, our country, our civilian communities, you know? Um, so it's just, I've taken ownership through my processes of learning about glass and, and my art medium and going, this is more than just me. You know, this is stuff that we can use elsewhere in conversation with other artists with, I don't know what, but um, that's part of what's driving me to do my work also. So. But yeah. Well, and it's it's great that you're going to be speaking at the Museum of Glass on Veterans Day, November 11th, and yeah. I encourage people to check that out. Um, uh, you and there'll be Hot Shop Heroes um, folks who are there and and their work on display, and um, mm -hmm. yeah. I believe a, a chorus made up of veterans as well. It's a two hour ceremony, I think. So there'll be the color guard. There'll be a few things with fused glass. There'll be, uh, so there'll be some other options besides hot glass and the hot shop. But it's primarily uh, a celebration for the veterans going through the, well, veterans day, of course, but then also the veterans that have committed to going to the hot shop for heroes program um, or hot shop heroes program, excuse me. Um, and yeah, I think it's a, a chance that, you know, they can feel a part of something, you know, that's very, different to them but it's very celebrated in the world that we're coming from so there's a a bridge that's happening here mm -hmm. which is right down the street from these spaces which i couldn't ask for anything more it's like asking santa claus for your gift and you've got it like here's a chance to be you know beneficial in this location to work through this museum of glass and they're doing that they've been doing this program for about 10 years now um and it's essentially working for veterans that are struggling cognitively with ptsd or TBI, uh, tra traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress or traumatic brain injury. And uh, they work together as teams and it's a very um, great thing. They, they start to set aside some of their restraints or, or these things that have been restricting them from life and they work together and they, they grow. So it's a beautiful thing. It's part of their award ceremony and um, yeah, Veterans Day. Yeah. Yeah, I, I look forward to to going to that and, uh, yeah. and following that program and it's it's had a huge positive impact yeah i just recently found out about it and i'm i actually um i'm excited to do more with them and try to work further in the future with just what that narrative is so mm -hmm. we'll see we'll see what happens but yeah it'll be a good start to kind of chit chat and and get some eyes on a new perspective i think when looking at my work um, for, for people that have served, I think there's just this direct relationship to it because of, they wore the same things. They, they used the same things. They did the same things, you know? So there's, it's, it's not my personal story. Um, I just feel that I've been able to be a vehicle to help kind of get some things, you know, to the next stage. And that's really what I've been trying to, to do this whole time is just, you know, also help myself understand, but yeah, I think that, Art's a great platform to do it in, just this kind of open conversation. 
Yeah, definitely. The the work that you've made for the exhibition, um, it you're talking about the 520. That's was that your unit or? Yeah, that was the battalion I served with. Mm-hmm. Um, a battalion that I served with. A, usually, an infantry battalion will have a headquarters group, which I was a part of uh, for half of my time. And then they'll have um, companies that are basically infantry ground units that will go out and do the large army frontline maneuvers and things like that, um, depending on where you are. But that's the idea of the the headquarters and then um, smaller um, assistance battalion or uh, companies that do a lot of the movement, the troop movement. So the headquarters is in charge of that. And um, so there's a, a about you know, 600 people or so, five to 600 people in a group that deploys under battalion. And there's, there's, it kind of varies with personnel because of mission set attachments, what's necessary. So the numbers are always a little different, but the premise is, uh, you know, oversight of a few things that do the the dirty work on the ground. Um, But that was the the headquarters in the 520 battalion is who I served with. They're underneath the third brigade, second ID. There's three brigades, I think, that are infantry brigades on Fort Lewis or JBLM, and each brigade has a, a, a handful of battalions. So there's four to five battalions under a brigade. So there's there's a good chunk of people like myself at JBLM that have been there and done this for the you know the time that we were fighting there. That's Joint and, Base Lewis McCord. Is that right? Joint Base Lewis McCord. Yeah, right there on Tacoma I uh, Tacoma and I five. Um, it used to be Fort Lewis and um, Lewis McCord, now it's Joint Base Lewis McCord where they have access to basically the essential properties um, mm-hmm. where it was div- divided and things like that. There's just more, it, we work together, Air Force and Army a lot, mm-hmm. um, you know, Navy, Marines. So yeah, that's why I'm excited to have the opportunity with you in Bainbridge and, and, and the Bainbridge Arts and Crafts because of the location, because of the, you know, the military community up there. It's a, it's a big one with the Navy, Army and Air Force. Yeah, and our hope is to build bridges between communities that are you know, physically close together, but culturally yeah. kind of a world apart. So yeah. we hope this exhibition will you know, help in that way. <laughs> in yeah, every way. little bit ha- helps, every chance something like this comes up, it helps. And I'm starting to see more of the nation's footprint. Um, Very similar things are happening or have been happening for, you know, a handful of years now. So it's it's kind of the the new kind of rise from the fall of what was this 20 year war. How are we processing things? And thankfully mental health is out in the public for conversation. You know, if we rewind the clock, you know, Desert Storm or things like that, I mean, you're going to be somewhere else if you talk about your mental health, probably locked up or, you know, it's just how we treated mental health way differently than I feel we do now. It's acceptable. People are actually making strides and being, you know, smart about their mental health and and, and using steps to produce a positive process towards bettering your mental health Mm -hmm. and support it. So that, that's a great time to talk about what we can do. Um, rather than fallouts like Vietnam or other wars, what can we do now to learn from this right now? Because people are dying left and right, and I'm I'm exhausted from it. I know a lot of people are, you know, from our community. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, thank you for all of what you guys are doing as well. Um, um, it goes a long ways. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing this very personal journey that yeah. you've been on, and and we're just so appreciative to to get to share your story thank you yeah thanks so much please stop in to see the exhibition called art and service featuring jim anderson jeffrey boten and ron stewart from november 4 through november 27th